anytime you have somebody who's really good at something, they also usually have a pretty strong deficit on the other side. And it's like to wish their deficit away is to wish away their strength. Right. And so I think for the two of us, we've accepted each other's deficits and almost find them endearing. Mm -hmm. And what, so what is your deficit? I am clear. not the most flexible person. You know, sometimes I can't help but, you know, Alex say books a meeting and I'm like, well, why would you put that meeting there? Because if this meeting is right before it, then you're going to need to do this in 15 yeah. minutes in between. And he's like, oh my God, woman, can you stop? And Alex is very, his, you know, downside or, or you know, the, the deficit is that he tends to always, uh, he tends to think he's right more than not. I'm Layla Hormozzi, CEO of Acquisition.com, and you're on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Everyone, I'm Brian. Welcome to another episode of the show. Layla, thanks for having us back to your world headquarters. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, Hormozzi Nation uh, world, what, what are we calling this? The executive boardroom? Uh, yeah, the executive boardroom in a uh, place that is unknown and we will not speak of. It's undisclosed. We're in a secret location. Um, I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? Interesting. Um, well, not by going to school. Um, I started with really no experience. So actually got into, I went to school for exercise science, um, which proved to be pretty useless. Um, you know, learned a lot about human physiology, but didn't learn a lot about business. And then quickly I knew that I wanted to uh, leave my hometown. So I lived in Portage, Michigan, pretty small town. Um, I moved out to California because I was a big, like Tony Robbins, Jim Rohn, they all said, move to California. That's where all the successful people are. So I was like, of course I need to go to California. Um, so I packed up my little Prius. I drove out there. Uh, I got like an apartment, which ended up being like in the ghetto, which is why I could afford it. Um, and I went and I mapped out in walking distance where the closest gym would be. And that was because I had a degree in exercise science, again, useless, but not for this. Um, so I figured I can get a job at any one of these gyms that I can walk to. So I went and I applied. I got a job offer at, I think, all of them, um, which you did. <laughs> <laughs> and then I picked 24-hour uh, fitness, actually, because it was the quickest one that I could make money at. And I had like $5,000. I just moved out there. My rent was like 1200 a month. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need to make money immediately because that's just rent, right? I have to eat and all that. Yeah. Put a timestamp on this. So what year are we talking about here? I want to say this was like 2013, maybe. Okay. 2013. Mm -hmm. So we are, we're basically uh, six, five, six years into or coming out of the recession mm -hmm. of 08. Uh, things are getting better progressively. Um, it's all about Facebook and Instagram at that point in terms of social. Snapchat mm -hmm. is so starting to become a thing. Yeah, it was a thing. It was right. a thing. Um, what else is happening in 2014? Uh, where in the country, where in California did you move? Uh, Costa Mesa, Newport Beach area. Okay. Yeah. I know it well. Those are yeah. my stomping grounds. Yeah. You know, the 24 hour fitness in the triangle there? In the triangle square? Yeah. You're kidding me. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Yeah. That's a hot spot. It is. A, I didn't know that. Uh, the first time I walked in, I kid you not, and this does not happen there all the time, but I'll never forget, you know, coming from Michigan, it's like people working out at the gym, sweatpants, hoodies, whatever. I'll never forget. There's a woman in a sports bra with little shorts and high heels walking on the incline on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. And that just like set the tone for the next chapter of my life. <laughs> that kind of says everything. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who don't know Southern California, I mean, there's little pocket communities, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said Costa Mesa, but it, that's really kind of old Costa Mesa, new Newport Beach or old Newport Beach, kind of right around right PCH, kind of by Hogue Hospital, if you know the place. Mm -hmm. Triangle Square was uh, a super cool new development back in the late 90s and it kind of fizzled out because they had a big huge nike town there and that was like the cool thing okay. it was and it was big retail shopping but it kind of failed but oddly enough that 24-hour fitness which is a tiny little hole in the wall i know exactly where it is mm -hmm. the parking is terrible yeah, it's... it's super crowded so when i was single we used to call the people who went there uh, they had a very high degree of talent which meant they're very attractive. Yeah. There's just only attractive people coming out of there. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. Like, where are these people coming from? Yeah. It was weird. Weird, right? Yeah. But like, that was a spot. Yeah. Because yeah. especially coming from Michigan, it was like, what was a 10 in Michigan is like a like a four in Newport Beach. Okay. So it was a weird, uh, it was interesting. Yeah. A lot of beautiful people there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So luck or maybe fate that you ended up 
being pulled into that place. Right. Um, so I got pulled into there, um, quickly learned that, you know, I needed to understand marketing and sales because they basically handed you a clipboard. They're like, go get 15 referrals and then come back. And that was like your job interview. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't know that was supposed to be hard or, or not or what. They were like, go ask people. And I was like, sure, or whatever. What do I have to lose? I just moved all the way out here. Were you saying upselling like training and? Um... No, this was like, we didn't have the job yet. They oh, okay. just said, take this clipboard, go get the phone number. Go get referrals from the people that are already at the gym. Oh, I see. I see. Or whatever. Okay. Go to new, Whole Foods for new across the street. Yeah. Okay. For new signups. Um, like and that. I remember I did that and I got, I think I want to say like I got short of the goal. I got like 12 or something like that. And uh, while I was doing it, I just remember two girls sitting on the sidewalk in the entranceway under the parking garage crying, holding the clipboards. And I was like, what's wrong? And they were like, I'm not going to ask strangers for their phone number. Oh, okay. I remember thinking to myself, oh, girl, I got to eat. You know, like, yes. I'll ask a stranger for their phone number. So I think it was really out of, um, I want to say, like, desperation or, you know, desire to succeed. Like, I just moved out there that I was able to quickly learn the skill of sales first um, and then marketing to actually have a sustainable career in the fitness industry. Yeah. So do you think, uh, let, let's go back in the chronology a little bit to young Layla. Did you know uh, what you wanted to be when you were thinking about growing up? Like, what, what did you aspire to be when you were y much younger, like elementary school or even early on? Do you have signals? Uh, yeah, I wanted to be a veterinarian or an actress. So okay. Neither. Okay, so say more. Like veterinarian, what's? I loved animals. So me too. I think growing up, I had like twenty. I had like I think at one point we had like I don't even know how many cats. Like ten cats, like two dogs. I had two lizards. I had like three hamsters, a guinea pig, two crabs. Like, I mean, it was literally like mm -hmm. a zoo. Yeah. Uh, my granddad was a parasitologist. And so he had wild animals he would keep in the house. Like he would have an alligator in the backyard. He had a raccoon. This is also Louisiana. So you have to keep that in mind. No uh, judgment here. <laughs> right, right. Raccoons are adorable. <laughs> They're cute yeah. uh, until they bite you. Their little hands and yeah. Yeah, they're scratchy. Um, <laughs> and then, so that's why I liked animals. And on the other side, I think... Uh, I just liked entertainment. Like I liked making people laugh. I liked uh, making jokes. I liked mm -hmm. seeing people smile. So Are like- the only child? No, youngest. Okay. okay, so that maybe is a indicator of where that might've come from. No no pop psychology here, but that's <laughs> common in in, 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 the, in the baby of the family. Yeah. Oh, I see. They want attention. Yeah. They have know. to fight for it, you know, from older siblings. How many mm -hmm. siblings do you have? A one. So you have one older- Sister. Sister, okay. How How many years apart are you? Six. Okay, that's a pretty good little distance, though. It's not like you're competing. Interesting. Yeah, no, not yeah. really. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a firstborn. Okay. So that's there's a lot about firstborns too. They're yeah. more independent. You know, step into a parenting role, all that kind of stuff. I'm interested. I'm interested in psychology, so yeah. I study a lot of this. I don't know how much of it's accurate, but it's interesting yeah. to me nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. I don't know either. Okay, so, um, but did you get signals then? So you wanted to maybe be in front of the camera and you like pe making people laugh, um, which is sort of like little glimpses of maybe customer service-y kind of like sales-y kind of um, skills because you've got to be able to help people out, take good care of them, make sure that they are having their needs met, that kind of thing. Maybe. Um, you know, I think like what I wanted to be when I was a kid versus I think like that was all when I was younger, like if I really think about it. Um, and then after my parents separated, I think everything kind of changed. Like my personality changed my dynamic because mm -hmm. they were very much like helicoptery parents. Okay. Um, and then it turned into like the opposite. And then me learning how to take care of myself at a young age. And I think learning how to be resourceful mm -hmm. uh, to a degree. Yeah, uh, relatable. That happened to me too. My, my mom was married um, three times before I was 16. So yeah, you, you have to kind of be the responsible yeah. adult in the room. Yeah, exactly. And, and I've listened to a few of your things, hearing a little bit about you accidentally or just falling into trouble a little bit. Yeah, So I was 18. So that makes sense. Okay, so you're out here, you're on your own, you got to make things happen, it's sink or swim. Mm -hmm. You basically, you know, hustle your way to the sales, you, it's do or die. Yeah. Um, Where'd you go from there? Um, I decided to try and take all the clients I had and bring them to a private facility. So it's kind of like the traditional, like you see nowadays, like the trainer takes people from the gym and they go to a different gym. Mm -hmm. Um, because I felt like I didn't have enough autonomy and I finally understood 
what was next. Like they tried to get me to be a manager. They wanted me to move up. And I was like, I don't want to do any of this. And I was like, managing people sounds awful. Um, little do I know. Yeah. And I wanted to understand marketing. That was the biggest piece is like, you know, right at that point, we're in a gym like that. You're going out, you're going to Whole Foods. You're going to, you know, across the street. You're asking people for their friends' phone numbers to it's, get leads. It's like door knocking. Exactly. It's, yeah. It's 100%. And so I was like, this is hard. I want to understand, at that point, Facebook was taking off. And I was like, I want to understand Facebook marketing. Mm -hmm. And so I had heard about this gym that was in Southern California that was apparently the owner was just like a phenomenal leader. He was fantastic. He understood exercise. He also understood marketing and sales. And so I felt like I could learn a lot there. And so I took my clients, I went there, and I agreed to like teach group training, training classes there while I also brought my clientele. Um, and the goal was I wanted to learn marketing. And I wanted to also have a little bit more autonomy in terms of like my time because it's 24 hours, it's a little different. Um, and so I did that, um, but I quickly learned that it was not any easier there because they they didn't use Facebook. And I was kind of like, this would be, we should try it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point they weren't quite, they were newer, they weren't quite ready for it. They were already growing organically. And so there to get clients, like we would route out the neighborhood of businesses and we would go to the businesses, like myself and another trainer, for example. And we would bring baskets of whatever. I would make like protein cookies and things like that with sure. like little things that said like free pass. And we'd give them to the businesses. Yeah. And so it was honestly just more of the same. Yeah. It was the same kind of like door knocking, you know, getting leads type thing. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I uh, ask you a quick question? Because it's on my mind. Yeah. Um, marketing versus branding. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people talk about marketing. You know, I want to do marketing. In your mind, what's the difference between marketing and branding? I think when I think of marketing, I think of the efforts to acquire customers or attention. And I think of brand, I think of what you're known for. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like brand is dictated by the person receiving the, you know, material. And I think marketing is like the act of attempting to do that. So it's like marketing in a way creates brand, whether for the good or bad. I think that I would co-sign that. Yeah. Because I think that um, advertising is a function of marketing. Yeah. And as Alex would say, advertising is to make known. Um, and, you know, part of the marketing activities is to, whether you're canvassing the street, the neighborhood, handing out um, protein goodies, um, or, you know, hitting people up in the aisles of Whole Food, you're making something known. Known. Yeah. And you're doing agree. marketing activities. Yeah. And then people form an opinion uh, based on how they interact with you, and that becomes your brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. The brand sits in the hearts and the minds of other people. Yes. I mean, you can you can walk the talk, and if it's aligned, that's ideal. Yeah. Right. If you say you, you know, if you are who you say you are, then that else is aligned. But sometimes it's not, and that's where you run into trouble. Yeah, I think that moats more often than not that yeah. way. Yeah. Okay, so um, you wanted to learn marketing. It wasn't happening at this gym because they were either old school or they just weren't into it. Then what happened? So then, I was competing at that point in terms of in bikini competitions, which were like just starting at that time. The division had just uh, opened. Okay. And this is for people who don't know this category. Yeah. This is not like um, something you do at the beach. This is like fitness competitions. It's, yeah, it's a fitness competition. You know, it's a, technically a sector of bodybuilding. However, it's the lowest for women. So it's it's more of a, like a beauty slash fitness competition, if anything. Yeah. Um, so I was competing in those. I had a coach that was online and I was working with her and she said, you know, I know you're doing all this stuff, but like, why? Do, what if we partnered? And I was like, wow, cause she was making a very good income online. Thought to myself, like, if I could make that, I would be like, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. What and were you making at the time, by the way, ish? When I was at 24 Hour Fitness, I was making more. Like, I think I was making maybe like something like $8,000 a month, I think per month, because that was what I thought. Of. Yeah. Uh, and then I think when I went to this new spot, I was making like 5,000 because I like cut my prices. People had to move. I started taking their teaching their group classes. I wasn't like taking as much time to sell and have my own clients because yeah. I, but I knew I was like, I wanted to learn. So, yeah. and you were, you were in your twenties at that time. Yeah. I think I was 22. Okay. So 22 making six figures are almost six figures, right? Like oh, yeah, just under a hundred. Not bad. Yeah. No, 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 it was not at all. Not in the bad. beginning, I mean like, and, but you have to understand, like I, I was there for 14 months before I left. So it was like short and sweet and you know, that was it. Okay. But, um, and you, uh, were you in relationships? Uh, were you, were you just focused on work? No, I was not in relationships. Yeah. Um, the context behind that question is, um, I know a lot of people who are watching this, they feel like they've got to choose between, 
you know, what are the, there's like three choices. Like, you know, you can have friends, you can have relationships, you can have a successful business, you know, whatever, choose one of those, mm -hmm. choose two of those and not all of them. Was that your mindset or were you even thinking that way? I think that I, you know, I had been in a pretty low spot prior to maybe like the two years prior to moving there. So I had been drugs, alcohol, I was getting arrested all the time. Yeah. Um, You're messing your life up. Yeah, and I felt like at that point, I was like, I just need to work on myself. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, anyone that's gonna date me is not anyone I wanna date. And so when I moved out to California, I was like, I'm trying to better myself so that when I do want to date somebody, it's actually somebody I would like to date as well. Yeah. So that was kind of my focus at that point. Um, well, they say that you end up being with the person that you know is your equal in some ways, or you compromise. But yeah, yeah. So if you're trying to become someone, you know, you're thinking of this aspirational partner, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I wanted someone who is ambitious, career oriented. They had their own life, so it wasn't like a dependency thing. Yeah. Um. So, I uh, she this online woman that is training me basically, helping me with the bikini competitions, she proposed that. So on the weekends, I started helping build almost like a, an online portal, which back in the day was very novel mm -hmm. to have an online portal with training information, all these things in there. And that was what I did on the weekends. And during the weekdays, I was training my clients and teaching classes. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. I'm just working. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I didn't do anything but work. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really have any friends because I just moved there. Um, and most people drank or something I was trying not to. So it was like, you know, I didn't really want to be around it at that yeah. point. And, and maybe we'll just give a little bit of the back story. I mean, you basically turned your life around. I mean, you have said and shared pictures on, I've seen them on Instagram where, you know, you were this kid who was not in shape. Yeah. And then you grew into this young woman who realized her potential and wanted to be something different and completely turned things around 180 degrees. Yeah. It's not I like you were always doing these, you know, no. competitions and you, you know, born with the, perfect genetics God, no it was no. none of that no no no. i was like it was like transformation yeah i was like nerdy kid chunky fat not the best like never bad at school but never the best like i was just like mediocre i guess um and i think it was hitting that low when i let myself get to you know just incredibly overweight drinking all the time partying all the time doing drugs you know not surrounding myself with people that i wanted to be you know that were conducive to anything productive in my life um, and I'm really grateful for it because I don't, you know, I think when, <laughs> I think motivation is created by lack. And so it's like, the more you lack something, the more you feel motivated, right? That's like, it's like if, if somebody has just eaten, they're not hungry, right? There's no motivation to eat because they're already full. Right. Um, and I think I was, I had so much lack in my life because of all the things I had done to myself that that's what created the fuel to turn everything around. Yeah. Um, and go so far in the other direction. You know what I mean? It wasn't like oh, I'm going to go like a few steps and like, you know, just lose weight. It's like, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to compete in these competitions. I'm going to build an insane career. Like I just had so much motivation to go so much farther. So it almost felt like a slingshot. Yeah. Isn't it interesting though, that the momentum goes both ways. So like when you are starting to slack off or maybe not eat right or neglect exercise or start to indulge in something you shouldn't, it just gets easier and easier and easier to do that. And then all of a sudden you're at rock bottom. Mm -hmm. But then the opposite's true. You start like, you quit all that stuff and you're like, well, you know, I'm doing all this working out. I Now I need to eat right. That doesn't make yeah. sense. And then, well, I need to do this instead. I need, you know, it's just it, that momentum goes both ways mm -hmm. for better or for worse. I think it's almost confidence, right? It's like you do one thing and then you believe you have the confidence to do the next thing. It's like, well, if I can work out, I can also eat a little bit better. And yeah. then I can also make these better. And I think the same goes in the opposite direction. Oh, I'm a piece of shit. I didn't eat right yesterday. Might as well not go to the gym. That's just, right. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So I was at this weird inflection point where I was like, you know, I've known for a long time since I was like 15 that I want to start my own business. I didn't know what it looked like. I knew it was something in fitness. Um, I'm kind of just like, I felt like I was like, my eyes were closed and I was feeling around. I was like, all right, is it, am I going to start a gym? Is that what I'm going to do? Like now I understand how to fill a gym, how to have clients, all these things. Like I could do that or I can partner with her and do this online business. And I was at that inflection point when I met this guy on the internet um, named Alex. And 2015-ish. Yeah. Okay. Um, or maybe 2016, one of those. So met him. Uh, it was a random Bumble date. So it was, it was on Bumble. I'd been going on dates for 18 months. So you have to understand. All right, so help me. And I, I don't understand Bumble because really? I, met, I met my 
wife early. Okay. And I didn't have to use Bumble <laughs> or any other. But yeah. so explain how Bumble works. I mean, I sort of know, but like yeah. explain it for people. So you get on the app and it's basically like for a, for a woman, this is when I was on it, by the way, it's been like eight years. So I hope they've progressed. Um, you know, basically you come on and it says you've got it'll, a screen pops up with a picture of a guy it says like his name, his age and location. And it's, you know, swipe left or right, depending if you don't like him or like him. Yeah. So Bumble's the woman's choice, right? Yes, and the the difference between Bumble and Tinder is that Tinder guys can message a woman if even if the woman doesn't like them, right? Which means like on Tinder, I had like hundreds of people. It's disgusting, right? And it's all like, it's gross. Yeah. Uh, Bumble, unless I also like the guy, they can't message me, and then I have to actually initiate the message. Yeah. So it's like double opt in. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Just feels safer for women. One hundred percent, and that was what I was looking for. So yeah. I felt like okay, I don't feel like as scummy of guys are going to be on Bumble. You know what I mean? Right. So what did he look like? I mean, was he the full bearded uh, king that he is now, or was he like the no chest hair? Uh, what, what was he like? I, he was like no chest hair, young baby, young baby face. Yeah. Uh, I remember the picture was him standing in a pool, like shirtless with sunglasses on. Okay. But it said under his profile was something to the extent of like own four gyms, business, and like bourbon or something like that. Okay. And Still I remember- kind of a player uh, move. Totally. Yeah. Um, but I was like, okay, he's really cute. And then business, he owns four businesses and he says he likes business. I was like, I love it. Like it's, he put that first, which said something, right? Mm -hmm. Motivated. Yeah. Uh, ambitious. Yeah. And he had lots of pictures of himself lifting weights. And that was kind of my profile too. So I was like, okay, he likes working out. He likes, we have common interests. Mm -hmm. So I swiped on him, messaged him, probably said something very awkward. I'm not very like good at, the, I'm like, hey, what's up? Like, I, I don't <laughs> know. Um, and he quickly was like, let's get off this app. Can I call you? And I was like, okay, yeah, absolutely. Because what I hated was when the guy takes so long. You're on the app and he's like asking you questions on the app. And you're like, are you going to freaking ask me out on a date? Yeah. Like, well, he's probably vetting, something. right? Like looking for red flags and vetting all the... I guess so. But I'm just like, it's just it's just kind of like, it feels like a waste of time, right? For me, at least, it was like I have 30 minutes of my lunch every day where I'm like swiping and talking to them. And then besides that, it's it. So I was just like, let's go. Um, and he called me. I was like, sure, here's my number calls me and he was like, I figured that we could just get our first date out of the way on the phone. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, let's do it. And mm -hmm. he literally asked me and I asked him like all the questions you would ask on a first date, like parents, do you want to have kids? What do you see for your future? What do you like to do? Like all that stuff. Are you guys about the same age? Uh, he's uh, two years older than me. Okay. So about the same age. Yeah. And two so, years older for a guy is about your age. Yeah. Um, two to five years older. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, he felt like it was enough of an age gap. Um. So, you know, we had that conversation and then he's like, do you want to meet for Froyo tomorrow? So he was in Costa Mesa, Newport Beach area too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I said, sure. And then tomorrow came and I remember wanting to not go. So I like texted him. I was like, I'm sick. I can't go. <laughs> and he called me and he was like, you're not sick. <laughs> and I was like, what? Called and he's you like, out. you don't sound sick. I'm like, no, I really, I feel awful. And he was like, I don't care. It's Froyo. You'll be fine. And I was like... Wow. Okay. Yes. And I was so used to being the assertive one. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go on the date or I do. I was just like, it was almost refreshing to have somebody who was like. Called your bluff. Yeah. Called my bluff. I was like, hmm, okay. So you're type A. Yeah. And he's type A. Yes. And so you respected that I was like, I as a type that. A. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I go, we end up meeting for Froyo and I'll never forget. Like I, I was there first and he was like, I'm going to be a few minutes late. And I was like, great. Uh, good first impression, right? Because I'm very timely. I get there like 10 minutes early. Oh, okay. And he comes, he walks them from behind, sits down. And he was like, you want to go get some Froyo? That was like the first thing. And I was like, yeah. No smile, nothing. And I'm like, I remember we go and we're in line. I just kept thinking to myself, like, does this guy even like me? I'm like, is this thing wrong? I'm like, I, I make sure my pictures are not overly inflated so that in person I look just as good. Right, like, right, right. what is this? And we go in there, we get the Froyo, we come back, we sit down. Turns out later, uh, when I was 18, I got my whole back tattooed. Hmm. And when he walked up, he saw the tattoo. And he told me later, he's like, I saw that tattoo and I thought to myself, oh no. <laughs> Red flag. Red flag, yeah. Um, Can you talk about what it is? It's wings. Okay. Giant angel wings on my back. I mean, kind of <laughs> metaphoric. That's kind of cool though. It was, yeah, I mean. What does it mean? Uh, she flies with her own wings. So it was like when I was 18, like, 
honestly, I, nothing really. It doesn't mean anything to me anymore. So I mean, I can kind of see like the independence or the... That's what it was supposed to... Yeah, you're taking flight, yeah. leaving the nest, you know? Yeah. Becoming an adult. But it was really probably not the best idea. So mm -hmm. it's fine. It was in a period of low judgment. Fair so, okay. yeah. So, um, you know, we grab Froyo, we start talking. And I think what was so great was just, it was finally like I was having a conversation that I, with somebody who I felt like I shared the same reality with them. You're an intellectual equal. Correct. It was like, we're talking on the same playing field. I didn't feel like in many of the conversations, either I felt like the guy was like, can you shut the fuck up and just be cute? Or I felt like I was much more uh, ambitious than the guy. Yeah. Um. So it felt like those were what I was getting. And this was not that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was very interested. Um. We ended up walking for like four hours together. Um, okay. And that was really our first date was just we talked and walked for like four hours. Um, and it was so odd because like at the end of it, because we talked about business most of the time, like sales, marketing, gyms, because that was what we were both doing. Mm -hmm. um, by the end of it, he was like, I really like you and I'm really interested. And I also think you should work for me. You, you were in a uh, Alex Ramosi interview, <laughs> job interview. Yeah. And I was like, what? And I just remember I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, no, 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 it's, it's fine. It's fine. I just, you know, I felt like even if this doesn't work out, you know. Yeah. Although it's funny now, getting to know him a little bit better, just the short time we spent together in the last couple of interviews, um, time, you know, efficiency is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So he was he was like killing two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, uh, dating you as a prospect, but also job interviewing and, you know, all these things. He I was think he vetting. likes to make sure that people have high utility. Yeah. But just the efficiency of it all, it is it's so Alex. Okay. I'm with yeah. you so far. This is great. So, you know... Um, I'm like, eh, dude, I just met you. Like, I have things going on. Like, I have my own stuff going on. I don't really. Yeah. And I don't want, like, another job. So, no. Um, he's like, all right, all right, all right it's fine. Um, I mean, it's pretty gutsy on the first date. Everything about the I first mean, date was pretty gutsy. So. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty bold. Yeah. Just to throw it out there. He is bold. Um, and so, you know, we went on more dates. Um, and it was like, you know, the best way I can describe it is just like, I didn't want to stop talking to him. I was like, even if we don't end up dating, I just want to like hang out with this guy. Like, mm -hmm. I just really like him. Like, he's Something interesting. Yeah. yeah, we have a lot of stuff in common. We have a lot of the same perspectives. We have a lot of same viewpoints. We both are really interested in the same things and learning the same things. Um, and it was cr like very clear that both of us were ambitious and had our own lives, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to say about three weeks in, we'd been dating and he kind of just kept poking it. He was like, we should just work together. Like, I want to start this <laughs> business. And he kept saying, he was like, I want to start this business, but like, if it's just me, that's not a business and it doesn't work. But like, if you're here and you have the skill set that works, like, then it's a business and we know it actually works. And I don't want to do it alone. And I was like, I don't know, man. Mm -hmm. And um, then it was about a week later, he went and it, the idea was essentially like, because he was so talented at opening up these gyms or skilled at opening up these gyms and filling them up so quickly. He was like, we could go do that. And like, you have an equally, you know, you're equally skilled at sales. I can sell, like we could both go out to locations, basically fill up people's gyms for them and they would pay us. And he was using Facebook, what you wanted to use, but no right. one else and he would. was using Facebook and he showed me how to use it. And he showed me all that. And I was really interested. I was like, like the guru probably. I mean, I was just, what was mind blowing to me was like how hard I would work for 20 names and phone numbers. And then I would have to call them and work the lead and all that. And I was like, you can just get 20 in a day from $5? Like, <laughs> this is insane. Yeah. And I was just like, this is crazy. This makes my life so much easier. And so actually, he did come and to the gym I worked at. And he was like, I can set it up. And I was like, please. And so he came and he set it up. And they turned it off the next day. <laughs> oh, jeez. So I got one of the founders to agree. And then the other one was like, no, 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 turn it off. Like, we don't want to do that. And I remember I was like, oh. And that was kind of what sealed the deal in the sense of I was like, man, I really want to learn this. And like, it can it can really help this gym. Mm -hmm. and we can get so many more customers so much faster. Like, why would we not do this? And that kind of then like starts sowing seeds of doubt in my path there. Yeah, the tipping point for the others. Yeah. Right. So then I'm like, you know, talking to him and I'm, you know, I really think I can just do this online thing with this girl. And trust me, to this day, she's amazing. She was great. But he's like, he looked at me and he was like, why? He's like, I can just tell you're the person that does all the work and then other people take credit for it. And I was like, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to hear that, right? Yeah. Um, but it was true, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was doing a ton of work for free, not really doing like, there's nothing monetizing. Um, just out of like, you know, I wanted to, I didn't know much. I wasn't experienced. So it was like, that was, I was there to learn. Yeah. 
I, I want to just underscore mm -hmm. just something that I'm pulling out, which is, I mean, there's false modesty, like, oh, you know, oh, no, 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 I'm not this or that. But like, when you really are good and you're like, you know, you're the best, I mean, you don't want to brag about it, but there's no shame in owning that, right? There's yeah. no shame in leaning into that and be like, hell yeah, I'm the best. And I tend to be uh, insecure over uh, inflated of my skills. So mm -hmm. I just, I do default to that. And I think that's something that he pointed out from like day one. He's like, you underestimate how good you are. Yes. And yeah. um, and it's still like weird to say that out loud, honestly. Like, well, of course, because you have humility and you're a good person, you have integrity. But like the message I want people, if they're struggling with this, and sometimes it goes as far as this imposter syndrome, right? They really, they really are great at what they do, but like they feel like they don't belong or they have no business doing that because no one, you know, gave them a license to do or gave them permission or yeah. granted them this. But like, if you're really good and you know it, and you know by the the fruit that it bears, then own it, and it, there's you know nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah, no, I mean I don't disagree with that. I think a lot of people, like, at that point, I had no context to know if I was good. Does that make any sense? Like what uh, I was doing, it was like there was nobody, it was such a new concept in terms of like building anything online. Yeah. And also like in terms of sale, you know, actually I'll be honest, it was a little bit of doubt because I was one of the best salespersons. Yeah. I was like, oh, it must be luck. No, no, no. You had signals and you had yeah. results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those speak for themselves. That's that's my point. Yeah, I it's get like, everything. And I, I'm a big signal person because, um, and I speak from, you know, regret a little bit because sometimes I've missed signals in my life. I haven't listened to my intuition, my gut. And I think all of us, if we really listen to that intuition, we know what we should be doing or what we should not be doing. And as we listen and, and you know, are prepared to recognize those single signals when they come, it can help us make good choices. Yeah. Whether that's business investing, starting or stopping a business, starting or stopping a relationship, you know, mm -hmm. the signals are really important. Yeah. Well, I didn't... Um... I don't think I knew how to read any of that at that point in time. I was just trying. And I was, honestly, I think stress sometimes blinds you because I'd moved out there. I didn't know anybody. I was just trying to make enough money to live out there and I didn't want to fail. And so I was just so focused on the task at hand. I didn't really think about any of that. Like mm -hmm. in pure execution mode, not much thought to it. Um, but, you know, I, I expressed to Alex that I was like, I think it makes more sense to do this with her. And he kind of said that to me. And I was like, but I feel like she like she wants what I want. He was like, well, what's that? And I was like, I just want to help people. Like I truly, genuinely have always just wanted to make people's lives better. Mm -hmm. and he Back was to like, your veterinarian roots. You just want to care. You're a caregiver. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I remember he said this. He was like, what if you could do that and make more money? <laughs> yeah. Light bulb moment. Light bulb moment. And it really was for me. I was like, wow, I am really, that is all it is. Like I'm so focused on helping people that I actually am preventing myself from making more money. And then, you know, of course, the solution that he's proposing is that, you know, come do this with me. Yeah. So there's some bias, but yeah. also another lesson that I'm extracting from you right now, which is a, another good one, is this idea of the false dichotomy or false choice. And and you fell into that trap like I have too, which is it's either this or it's that. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You can help people and make money. Ta-da. Like there's, right. a, it's, it's this false choice. And oftentimes, you can have both or several. It's not one or the other. Okay. And I had a lot of assumptions that I think were rooted in, you know, like my upbringing where I like just what was social, like what were you socialized to believe? And I think that I was still in that mode. Like I was coming out of it, but not fully. Yeah. And there's your Tony Robbins, right? These self-limiting beliefs yeah. and the mm -hmm. scarcity mindset stuff that we've all been talking about recently. Yeah. And I yeah. think I assumed... My assumption that was so false was that it, it was going to take a very long time to get as good as I wanted to get. And I think that that was where I underestimated if it was my full focus and I was just obsessed with the thing at hand that I could get really good really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that was what I realized because, you know, then essentially what I did was I decided to do it with him. You know, he was like, I want to start this company called Gym Launch. Like, I want you to do it with me. And so that was probably the choice that changed everything because I left all my clients. I cut my roster. I I think I converted some to like online clients because I was like, oh, you know, I got to have something coming in because what if this doesn't work? Okay. Um, and then left my apartment, got rid of my lease and everything 
and flew out to Baltimore, Maryland to launch a gym with Alex. Mm -hmm. And the deal was that I was going to sit with him at the first one and watch what he did and like learn everything. And then the second one I would do on my own and then we would split ways and go and do it on our own. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I could have anticipated what would have happened from that point on. You know what I mean? Like I was like, I remember making the decision. I was like, no matter what, I will learn so much, whether it doesn't work or works, like it's worth the experience alone. Yeah. Did you have money in the bank? Like, did you have a safety net, a cushion, like? Like a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. So you're, you're living hand to mouth. Again, it's a pretty gutsy move. You're in, you're in your early 20s. Yeah, but the thing is, is, I'm like, what's the worst case? Like, I end up back at my dad's house. Okay, so you feel like that's, you had, you know. Like, that would be awful in my life. mind. But I'm like, I will not go hungry. Yeah. I have friends. I have family. I have some money. And I have the ability to make money. So I was yeah. like, I can just go get a job at a gym again. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Can I ask you this too? Um, compared to back then, you're significantly further ahead now. Mm -hmm. Is it harder to st start something new now? Um, because in theory, you have farther to fall? Or is it easier because you have all these resources, you know, a significant amount of money in the bank? Easier or harder today than it was back then? It's easier because I don't care nearly as much as I cared back then. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? I was so concerned with how humiliating it would be to fail. This is this makes no sense, right? But I was like, my family, high school friends, college, if I fail, they're all gonna see. Yeah, because you announced I'm going to yeah. do my thing. Yeah. And I think that I'm just now to a point where I don't care so much if I fail because I also trust myself enough to get back up. And I also know that I am graceful in my failures. Mm -hmm. And so I think I have that trust in myself. Um, versus before I didn't have that. Do you think, how much, what percentage of that anxiety was manufactured by you and how much of it was reality? Like if you had failed and you'd come back tail between your legs, whatever and you had to be like, I need to live with you, dad. What, what percentage did you make up in your head to be scary versus the actual reality of it? I mean, I think that the reason I was able to make the jump is I identified that all of it was made up in my head. Yeah. That's my point is like, yeah, I, I mean, I still do that today. It happens a lot. Yeah. I catch myself. Exactly. And I think it took me longer to kind of work through that back then. And now I think I'm just much faster, which is like, well, that's not a good reason just because you think you might feel a certain way. You're scared of a feeling, you know, yeah. or judgment. They call it fortune telling, right? You know, mm -hmm. no one knows the future. Yeah. But you try to fortune tell or forecast the future. I mean, maybe something bad's going to happen, but most likely it will not. Right. And that's okay. where a lot of this you know, angst or fear, you know, kind of stifles us. I think it's also just more bad things have happened and I've dealt with them. And I I don't even tell myself like it might not happen. I'm like, it could definitely happen. Okay. But you can also deal with it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's about having calluses, right? That's like, you know, going through hell and back several times and be like, okay, I've been burnt, but now I got, uh, I'm, I'm torch proof now. I'm good. And I think it's also like looking at it in terms of if the worst thing happens, it's not going to make me worse. If right. anything, I've used every other instance in my life to make me better. So why would this be any different? Yeah. I'm like, wow, think of all the skills I'll, I'll gain if I have to go through that. Yeah. So I think I look at it more like that as I, I kind of trick myself and like, that would be such an opportunity to become a better person if it does happen. Not that I wanted to, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's you know. tremendous, tremendous mind shift power. I mean, that's, that's powerful if you're able to, when you're able to do that. Yeah. I don't mean. I think it takes training over time because it's like the first voice that comes in is like, that would be awful and terrible. We don't, we want to avoid that at all costs. Right. And I think I've just gotten like quicker at combating it with, no, that would be a great opportunity for you. Yeah. What a good challenge. That would really help you become who you're trying to become. Yeah. And so it just gets the two voices, like the the space between the two gets shorter and shorter over time. Mm -hmm. But it used to be like, might be like first one and then it's like days and then it's like a day and then it's like hours and it's like an hour and it's like 30, 40 and it's like one minute. And now it's like 10 seconds. Yeah. And so again, you know, for extracting lessons, um, if you're in a hurry to get through or get over what you're going through, sometimes it just, it's a process of, you know, that you need that experience. You need to try trial and error. You need to 
try and fail or get up again. You need to learn and it just takes time. You you have to earn that. You can't just, you know, wish that whatever you're going through is over. You have to, you know, go through experience and then then you have learned from it. But you can only do that by being on the other side of it. Yeah. I think any kind of change is a, it's a process, not an event, right? Yeah. So it takes time. I just say that because we're talking with people of all kinds of different experience, you know, and ages too. And it seems like the younger people I talk to, they they want things more immediate. Of course I did too when I was young, but it's like, all right, so you're 18, you wanna be the VP. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's go through this process first. I mean, if you've got the chops right now, by all means, you know, step into that spot. It's not about age. It's about, you know, whether you've got the skills. Um, but it's like, sometimes you just have to pay the dues. You have to learn the lessons yeah. in order to get to the mindset that we're, where you are now. I would agree. Okay, so you're in Baltimore. Um, what happened? Well, the first day that I was supposed to watch Alex and like that was like my first training day. It was gonna be like, all right, let's train for two weeks and then you can try something. Um, we had like all these sales appointments booked and he was going to teach me like, here's how I pitch people and like what we do for these gyms or whatever. Cause it's a different offer. And he got a phone call from a friend. He's like, I've really got to take this. And I was like, the guy's coming in 10 minutes. And he was like, I think you've got this. Oh. And I remember he just left. Did he set you up? <laughs> was it deliberate? No, he says it wasn't. Oh, um, okay. He's like, I just knew you would figure it out. Hmm. Yeah, he's like the master delegator. Um, <laughs> that's how I like to tell him. Okay. So I remember there were eight people coming in back to back. The first one that come, came in, you have to understand, we're selling in this gym that has no equipment, nothing, boarded up windows. Yeah. We're pre-selling for yeah. a gym that's going to open. You got to be freaking out. I'm freaking out. First guy that walks in, cop. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to jail. Yeah. I know this isn't illegal, but then I'm like thinking myself, like maybe this guy is scamming me this whole time. This guy from Bumble, like maybe I'm getting screwed. Like he left, like now there's a cop here. Like who knows? The cop didn't buy, but everybody else did. And he came back hours later. I'm like, I still don't know what this phone call was. And I think he set you up. Yeah, probably. Or rather not set up, but just like he had so much confidence. Okay, so uh, fun fact about me. So I have this skill too, where I am not that great at anything, but I can see the talent and skill in other people. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm sort of projecting on Alex too, like this, so if that's his mindset, he already knew that you could do it. And maybe you were lacking the confidence and he yeah. just wanted to give you that little nudge yeah, and like force you to do it. Yeah, he's great at that. I think that's probably what happened. Yeah. Um, and so then from that day on, we uh, we just split everything. It was like, okay, uh, people are coming in. We're going to split the appointments, split the work, whatever. Um, and that was the first gym we launched together. It was in Baltimore, Maryland. And then we split up and it was like I went to a different gym. He went to a gym and we started launching gyms. And it worked well when it was us. Um, you know, we made a lot of money off the gyms. They got a ton of clients, um, but we were exhausted. <laughs> um, and it was a ton of upfront investment to pay for their marketing, uh, the hotels, the flights, the, everything that we had to do, right? They were financing their business. 100%. Yeah. And so at that point, we were like, we need to get people to do this and we need to centrally operate it. And so... We're like, where do we find employees? You know, and at this point, you know, we're like traveling around the country. We don't really have like a home or anything. And I was like, oh, my, I keep in touch with all my friends from college. They're all like the top sales people at MLMs. I should call them. So I call them and I'm like, listen, how, this is how much money I'm making. Mm -hmm. This is how much money you could make. You know, I'm selling them on the opportunity. Yeah. I get five of my friends from college to quit their jobs and agree to, uh, it was going to be January 1st, flying out to launch five gyms, each of them on a different location. Yeah, but it's kind of a sure thing in your mind, right? In my mind, yeah. I was like, this is great. Like we've got this yeah, like, on, thing. On repeat, yeah, it's yeah. going. And we started building out, you know, training materials for them, schedules, you know, management systems, all that kind of stuff. And it was about a week before the launch that we went to go see my parents and for Christmas. And Alex shows up. We, we, I remember I had a dentist appointment. And Wait, was I, this the first time he met them? Uh-huh. Okay. So new guy. New guy. Bring him. My parents have always been like, Layla does whatever Layla wants. Like, she's always making weird decisions, right? Okay. And so I'm like, this guy's coming back to me. He was one I've been quit everything, fly my job, whatever. And they're like, okay. And 
my dad's very accepting. So he's like, yeah, if that's what you want, sweetie. Yeah, I just want you to be happy. I just want you to be happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so we come there. And I remember I was like, listen, you have to go hang out with my parents while I go to the dentist. We'll meet you. We're going to go do a movie. It's like Christmas Eve. And he shows up to the movie and my dad comes up to me and he's like, Layla, he's like, this guy is so stressed. And I was like, why is he so stressed? And he was like, I don't know. He's like, you should ask him what's wrong with him. And I like walked up to Alex and I was like, you look awful. Why are you sweating? We're like <laughs> sitting here. And um, he was like, the bank processor shut us down. And I was like, oh. Hmm. And I was like, well, that's not good. Yeah. What, <laughs> what did that mean to the business? It meant that we could not take money. And my friends had all just quit their jobs and four days later are supposed to be flying out and we're supposed to be fronting hotel flights and marketing expenses. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. So then we have to sit through this two hour movie. And I remember taking Alex's pulse and it was like, it was like 120. And I was like, oh my God. He's just sitting there resting heartbeat at 120. Just okay. so stressed. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, when you're going through those things, it's like, you become whatever you need to to help the other person at times. So mm -hmm. it's like I, I could remain optimistic and neutral during those times. Yes. Even though I was obviously not. I mean, I just ask all in my mind. That's absolute horror is like I just got people to quit their jobs and I might not be able to do it. Yeah. But you became the yin and the yang. You became that other side. Yeah. OK, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And so, you know, we're sitting. We go back to my parents' house. We're in this room and we're like, what should we do? And we're like, well, there's the credit card from all the gyms that you had. And it's got like a hundred thousand dollar limit. I remember Alex like took out the car and he was like, We've got to use it. And I was like, Yeah, there's really no choice. And uh Okay, wait, pause. A uh -huh. hundred thousand dollar credit limit on a credit card? Yeah, per month. Because he'd had was this so like many an Amex gyms. gold or was this yes. like okay. It was actually an Amex gold. Um yeah. it was because he had at that point when he had left, he had five gyms. Like he was putting all the expenses on his card. So he over years had upped the limit. Okay, I got you now. Yeah. yeah. So that's a that's a decent credit limit. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. Um and I remember he's like, We we can use the card and we can put it on here. He's like, we just have to make sure we make it back. And I was like and You have thirty days to do it. We've got thirty days to make it back. <laughs> yeah. And no pressure. Yeah. And I remember in that moment he was like, Listen, I'm a sinking ship. He's like, you know, we've been trying to make this work for like a year. He's at that point he had gotten um he had gotten into head I head on DUI. He had uh, had one of his partners who he partnered with without telling me when I had quit my job for, on one location, had then stolen all our money. Um, and so we'd gone through all these different things that were happening. And it was just like kind of a mess. You're getting a glimpse that maybe his judgment is slightly distorted uh, it, in terms of like picking business partners. Yeah, I think the the tough part for him is that he's very optimistic. Yeah. And that's his strength. And it's also when you don't have somebody there that you can trust to balance you, it can it's that's hard you know and just oh, yeah. like me without somebody who's very optimistic that can be hard to pursue no new opportunities yeah and you know for those who didn't see alex's interview with me before he talks about his relationship with his dad and the sort of family pressures and and he was you know fighting his demons too mm -hmm. like, like, maybe like you he had a lot of shit going on for sure yeah yeah he did and he used to tell me that all the time he's like i got a lot of shit going on i'm like yeah but he, you know, he always kept saying, he's like, I'm just like a sinking ship. I've got nothing going right now. Like, this is a, such a mess. And I always thought to myself, like, I can take care of myself. So like, if this doesn't work, that's fine. I'm not going to be crushed. And I think it's worth the experience and worth trying. Did that brutal honesty, though, make you trust him more? Because he wasn't fronting at all. He's just like, listen, uh, this is all, you know, this is all very bad. Um, I mean, he wasn't like faking it. Yeah. He's I mean, there was no faking it at that point, right? Yeah. Like. I'm buying groceries, like we have nothing like, I mean, yes, I trusted him more, but I think the trust was more so built through both of us going through what we had there that far together and not neither person like yielding to the pressure, if that makes sense. Yeah. You didn't bail. Yeah. Neither of us bailed. Yeah. Um, And I said, you know, he's like, you know, do you want to, if you want out, this is the time. And I was like, yeah. you know, and I think in a few such words i was like no <laughs> like i'm in it like let's do it like i think we can do it like i really do and i think a lot of it came from at that point i may not have had confidence in myself at that point in time but i had confidence in him for some reason and it's this weird thing where like he tells me he's like i had so much he's like i had confidence in you and i had confidence in him and it was like we were like borrowing it from each other yeah it was projecting it um well you're bolstering each other up I, well when he told me the story i was blown away what you said 
Do you remember what you said when yeah. he said, "Can you, uh, can you share yeah. that?" Because I yeah. think it, I think it's really, really important. You know, um, w one is greater than zero, two is greater than one. When you have two people who are united, you know, in purpose, in effort, I mean that that's everything. That's that's how you get to, you know, where you're trying to go. Yeah, yeah. He, um, you know, he said, "I'm a sinking ship." here's your out like if i were you i would leave like there's you've got nothing good here like i have no money this isn't going to work and you know i obviously don't have my shit together and i was like if it comes to it i would sleep with you under a bridge and i think i don't think that he had the attention at that point in his life to understand how much how loyal i was already and how much i did believe in him and so i think it was just like I was like, you idiot, I'm not going anywhere. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I was thinking to myself. I'm like, yeah. come on. I was like, I've, like, I love this guy. I believe in him. I believe in us. And I, I told him in that moment, I said, I just see, it's, it's like so weird to think about. It. I was like, I just see the future. Like, I see what we could be. And I was like, we can be so powerful together. Mm -hmm. And he was like, how do you even, and I was like, I just know. I remember saying this. I was like, we're so stressed right now. We've got so much going on. And like, you don't, we can't, we only see it. But when we see the glimpses of each other that are like who we, who we could be one day when we don't have all of this stuff going on. I was like, mm -hmm. it's so good that it's worth holding out. See, you've got the gift too. That's a skill to be able to look past what's happening right in front of you and extrapolate that and, and make a forecast. So you must be an extremely good judge of character, an extremely good judge of people. Yes, I will say that's the one thing I feel confident in my skill. That's that's a gift. Um, not everyone has that. Um, and I think if you have that in a partner, you know, romantic partner, business partner, I mean, that's that's everything, Layla. It's like, and it's, I, I can't speak from a woman's pers perspective, but from a man's point of view, if my partner says that to me, it's like nothing else matters. I can conquer the world. I will, you know, crawl across a mile of glass to get to the desk. I mean, if you say that to me, it's like, let's fucking go. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, and you know, from that point on, basically, it was six months of, we made it work and we were able to pay off the Amex. Mm -hmm. But what happened eventually was I, so I would like manage the back end for everything um, still because we didn't really have any employees besides salespeople. So it was like all the billing, all the customer service, like all that stuff. I had like different burner phones for every location <laughs> of a gym. And I remember one day, uh, one of the gym locations, like I get a bunch of calls from customers. And this girl called me and she's like, Layla, she's like, I was, Jeff just stood up on a chair and said, I need you to go get a refund and get the fuck out of my gym. Mm. And I was like, what? She's like, hey, you just told us all the like charge back and refund. And I was like. Mutiny. Yeah. So then I went, I logged in the bank account and it was just like minus 500 charge back, minus 500 charge. And I was like, oh God. And so I went to Alex and I was like, dude, we can't keep doing this. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, what is it? And I showed him. We have a mole. Oh, and he was just like. He was, I could just tell he was like, seriously, like after all of this, after all this trying, like yeah. this isn't working. Yeah. And went into, I think, full panic mode. Um, And he was like, we need to do something different. And I was like, I don't disagree. Like if we do more of this, what which what did continue to happen was like, then another guy does the same thing. And what they realize is, oh, I'll tell them to refund and then go, go and they can pay me half what they paid you. Yeah, I mean, you identified a vulnerability and someone was exploiting it. Exactly, and then it mm -hmm. continued to get exploited. So what we were worried that was going to happen did. And so mm -hmm. then what was happening was we were just collecting enough from the next month's launches to pay for the refunds from the prior month. Yeah, it's downward tough. spiral. Downward spiral. And so we're like, okay, we can't do any more launches, but we're gonna owe $180,000 in refunds. What the <laughs> do we do to make that much money? <laughs> And Alex, obviously, you know, he's been investing in his marketing skill set this whole time. Um, he's like, I, he's like, I think what we need to do is you become the face of the company. We're going to build a weight loss company. You're going to be the face because you've lost all this weight. You still have your online clients, right? I was like, yeah. He was like, so we'll just scale that. 
and I will create the funnel and I'll do the marketing in the back end. I'll be like the back end tarp marketing guy and you just be the front end face and you make the, the coaching program. Yeah. And I was like. It makes yeah. me think about how you divide and conquer now. Mm -hmm. So like, is Alex still the marketing and advertising? Is he the growth and outreach guy? And if so, then what is Layla's role? I mean, you're the glue that seems to hold it all together, but like you seem to be buttoned up, organized, uh, analytical, uh, being able to vet good ideas or not good ideas. Talk about those strengths. How do you divide those? I think it's taken us a while to get to the point where we are because in the beginning it was like the times that I'm talking to you about, it's actually weird to talk about because, you know, he was two and a half years ahead of me in terms of career wise. He had more skills than I did. So there was, I had less skills than him at that point in time. And I think that as we got into business together, we split what the responsibilities were. And it was first and foremost, Alex handles marketing and Layla handles everything else. And I had a skill deficit at that point because I didn't know how to do anything. And so I had to learn. And then it took me a little bit of time to get to the point where then I think we, we evened out. And now we've been able to grow together in those skill sets equally. Mm -hmm. So are you doing as much strategy uh, or are you doing more of it or less of it now? Because the, you know, the strategy, like for the business. Yeah. So much like more. We're, we're talking about marketing. I mean, before marketing comes the strategy, it's like, what are we going to do? Right. Yeah. So in terms of the strategy of the business, typically it's, I have a few strategies that I find appealing and Alex has a lot. And then we try to meet in the middle, right? Where it's like, I typically have very like simple, I like simple businesses and like low complexity. Give me an example. Acquisition.com. <laughs> okay, but like a, a more granular, like what is an example of, of you know, that's not acquisition.com, that's a simple business. Is it like owning a, uh, storage unit facility. Yeah, it could be owning a storage unit facility. Yeah. It could be owning, um, you know, uh, a few hair salons. It could be anything that's very straightforward. It doesn't yeah. seem like it's complicated. It doesn't have, you don't need any genius skill sets to make it work. Yeah. I mean, like sense. in the food business, you have a certain, the clock is ticking against the food because it goes bad and it spoils. You have, there's yeah, a lot of loss, like food. Yeah. right? Right. Um, uh, I would say like anything that's boring. It's like people hear it and it's like not sexy. It's not exciting, right? Brick and mortar businesses for the most part. Service oh, that businesses. You like. Okay. Yeah, I like those. Um, Laundry mats. Yeah, like I mean, I, sure, that's a little small in terms of like revenue, but um, but those I find appealing because I think to win those, you win by having a better team. Yeah. Right. Sidebar: Have you ever thought about the efficiencies of some of these boring businesses? Like uh, it triggered my brain for a second to think about laundry mat. Uh, I have. Uh, washing washing machine and dryer at my house now. Um, I'm at that stage of my life. But at one point I had to use laundry mats and it was, just seemed like such a waste of time. Wouldn't it be cool to have like a gym and a laundry mat put together or like a movie theater and a laundry, you ever thought about these things? Uh, you know, I heard what they're coming out with is something similar, but a little different, yeah. which is like a facility where, you know how you like, you've got the dentist you have to go to once a year. You've got the doctor, you've got to go. They're building like places where you basically have like all of those in one building. And in one day you go, so oh, can, so it's kind of similar, different concept though. Yeah, I'm an idea guy. So I have a lot of, my brain thinks this way. It's like, we need to make this better, more efficient, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so I think in terms of how we do things now, Alex and I always, it, it's... Wait, so he doesn't like boring businesses or he does? Because boring, as another word for boring is like stable, low maintenance, low risk. I think that his natural proclivity is towards more exciting businesses, but mm -hmm. with in his mind, it's something that's low risk because he is skilled in the area that would be the risk. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's he talked about information arbitrage all the time and maybe he just knows everything about that and so therefore it's easy. So give us an example of something that excites him or lights him up that maybe is not that easy. Um, yeah, so uh, he had the idea for a business where you essentially attach to the back of every YouTuber um, and you create their back end. So you... Um, all these YouTube people, you know, all these people on YouTube, I'm on YouTube, um, they have, they're great at marketing, but they have no monetization vehicle behind them. And so he had the idea of basically building monetization vehicles for all these people and then taking a piece of the company for that. Mm. Creating a funnel for them for other opportunities. Right. Which to a lot of people that would look like hard because it's like creating a monetization or a mousetrap and getting like monetizing correctly is usually what most people get wrong for him like he's very skilled there so he's like that looks easy yeah i got yeah. this yeah but yeah did you kibosh it or yeah i don't like that 
Yeah. I think it's yucky because I look at it like this, which is the the likelihood that the YouTuber would be dissatisfied with the way that we want to monetize is so high. The likelihood that could we coerce them into saying, yes, I will create this as my back end because they respect Alex and look up to him. Yeah. Yes, we could get them to say yes one time. Yeah. Could it's, we get them to continuously be loyal and push the product? Probably not if they don't absolutely love it and it wasn't theirs. Uh, this is a SaaS product we're talking about probably, right? Mm, it could be anything. It could be like a portal, could be selling information, could be a course they built. Okay. I mean, it could be SaaS, um, could be product like ARAC sells Pizza Fi. You know, it could be anything. Um, but it's basically like a way to monetize their following. Yeah. But you think the risk of customer satisfaction is high or or it's probable the probability is low and therefore you think it's a bad idea yes because i think of most things in the business in terms of like reputation because i mm -hmm. think reputation is the end all be all of a business now we're back to brand i love it yeah so it's it's how can we build a business in which way in a way where when we do business with the customers or the partners or whomever it is that it builds the brand doesn't detract from the brand yeah, they become your champion, your advocates. Yeah, they and I think the more complicated the business and the more that you do on behalf for somebody else, the more you leave margin of error where they could, their expectations could be mismatched and they could not like what you've given them. So like the more a done for a business is done for you, and especially a customized done for you business, I mean, those businesses have such, for the most part, it's like the reason Gym Launch was successful is because we did a lot for them, but it was for the same kind of business over and over again. Mm -hmm. So we got really good at doing it for a certain kind of business. The reason that a custom done for you agency is so often going to fail is because you're doing a large amount of work on someone else's behalf for their business and it's custom to them. And so you're not an expert at it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't like those. I don't want to play a game where I think I'm going to fail. I yeah. think that there's enough complexity in business as is like to scale a business is hard. Let's not make it any harder by picking something that's inherently by nature of the product already hard. At least yeah. that's the way I see it. Yeah, I just want to go back to this um, this partnership that you guys have that's so dynamic and seems to be so uh, working so well. Uh, and just point out some subtle things again, which is you kind of burst this bubble. You shot down his idea, pew, pew, but mm -hmm. he has enough respect in you to trust your judgment. And so he probably... I mean, does he give pushback and you like, are you guys like um, wrestling metaphorically about different ideas? And then is it like you have to have a unanimous uh, decision for it to go forward? Or is it like, okay, Alex, I'll let you try that, but I don't like it. I don't love it. No, it's very much, we beat ideas up together. Right. Before we were to pursue something. So this is what I'm getting as this mutual respect for each other's judgment and skill set. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think. But how we communicate that has been the last seven years of, of learning, yeah. which is typically, um, I think it, it's learning to respect one another's strengths and not try to change one another. Because I think you know, we were talking about this the other day with each other is like, anytime you have somebody who's really good at something, they also usually have a pretty strong deficit on the other side. And it's like to wish their deficit away is to wish away their strength. Right. And so I think... For the two of us, we've accepted each other's deficits and almost find them endearing. Mm -hmm. And what, so what is your deficit? I am clear. not the most flexible person. Okay, so once you get into an idea, you you dig your heels in and that's that's the way it should be. Flexible in terms of how I like to do things. Like I like to, in work, I'm extremely efficient, extremely organized. Like I think of the most effective and efficient way to do things at all points in time. Yeah. And I also am very strategic in terms of how is this going to move me forward to what I want and is it going to get in the way of the main thing, right? Yeah. I get that because I'm married to someone like that. Right. Her brain thinks like an algorithm. Yeah. Why didn't you turn down that street? It's like 30 seconds yeah. faster. 100%. That's ridiculous that you're going straight. Well. Right. And so it's like, you know, sometimes I can't help but, you know, Alex say books a meeting and I'm like, well, why would you put that meeting there? Because if this meeting is right before it, then you're going to need to do this in 15 yeah. minutes in between. And he's like, oh my God, woman, can you stop? Are you good at puzzles? Mm, I don't like puzzles. Okay. But... You might be good at puzzles. Maybe. <laughs> um, I get it though. And Alex is very, his, you know, downside or, you know, the, the deficit is that he tends to always, uh, he tends to think he's right more than not. Hmm. And so, is that overconfidence, or um, is he is he sort of like um, overconfident, like uh, assuming things are going to go well, or yeah. what is that? 
Yeah, but it's worked out more than it hasn't. Over optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and the thing that we've talked about is both of us, those those tendencies we have serve us more than they don't. Because if they didn't, then we would change. Mm -hmm. But him, his overconfidence has led him to more success than it has not. Right, because constantly doubting yourself. I mean, like that's probably not going to be very helpful. Yeah. Again, um, knowing a little bit about his past, I f I feel like that's a survival mechanism. I mean, both of you maybe are acting that way, but sure, it serves him well and serves you well. Yeah, and I think, I think that because we have, you know, I would say like complementary uh, strengths and and weaknesses, that that's why together we make such a good team. Mm -hmm. And because we don't try to change one another, you know what I mean? Like it's like, I. We can laugh at each other's tendencies and yeah. talk about them openly and yeah. not fight about it. Yeah. Well, and also at the end of the day, when you have consensus or you respect the other person's opinion, I think where people get in trouble, especially if they're in like a business partnership or, or a romantic relationship and you concede and you're like, well, I think it's a terrible idea, but go ahead. And then when it actually fails, there's the, I told you so, the resentment starts kicking in yeah. and, and that's where you start to you know have this wedge being driven between you yeah and you're divided you're not united yeah we we have done that one time enough to learn that we should not do that again yeah that's it's really hard yeah yeah so you know in terms of coming up like deciding the strategy and the vision of the business we do that together and then you know we kind of divide our alex focuses all on the marketing like that's his creative genius like obviously i think everyone knows that's what he's known for mm -hmm. um and then i focus on the the running of the company the scaling and so traditionally like we're both founders if you looked at it from like an org chart standpoint like we don't name ourselves this but he would be cmo i would be ceo mm -hmm. if you look from like a traditional standpoint yeah um i just feel like that's a very limiting on, on both ends because there's so much crossover and it's not like Neither of us know anything about the other person's. I mean, obviously, if you work with each other all day, like you could pick up things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this series is called Behind the Brand. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about brands. We did a little bit. Uh, what is the Layla Hormozy brand? Or maybe should we say what's the Hormozy brand? Because is it now, you know, is it complete? Or is there a Layla brand and an Alex brand? Like, yeah. Maybe break it down. Um, I think that uh, obviously we have our brand together because... Like when Alex and I met, like we we have so many similarities that I think we just had when we met that it's kind of, it's it's weird because most people don't have that I think um, so there is like our brand together as a couple that we put out there yeah. as business people what whatever you want to call it how right? do you describe it forceful okay <laughs> I don't know powerful um, I would say powerful. I think another word would be we want to represent excellence or greatness. Um, candorous. Character, high integrity. That's what I think of. Um, I can't help but notice you are always pretty well dressed and he is in uh, jean shorts and uh, flannels. Do you have any say on like, you know, the look of his brand or... Is that is that the brand? That's him. Yeah, that's just him. Uh, the nose strip, the breathable strips, the, the whole thing. It's. I mean, that's part of why I love him so much. Is like, when I met him, he just like never has given a fuck about what anybody else thinks. Yeah, including me, which I like. You know, um, yeah. I like that kind of confidence because you can't help but start to be a little bit more like that yourself when you're around somebody like that. So, so it's not deliberate. He, that's just what is in his drawer and what he feels comfortable. Alex doesn't want to think about what he's wearing every day. And so he finds, I mean, he'll buy 40 pairs of shorts to pick the one that fits the exact perfect way, that fits his phone perfectly in the pocket, that has the right kind of draw, drawstring that can also be worn to swim and you don't need to wash every okay, day. We're back to the efficiency thing. Remember I told you, like he thinks about efficiency. Yeah. Uh, dating you and interviewing for the job. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I tend to be very efficient in the workplace but when it comes to out of work like i i still like very like girly like i like shopping and i like clothes and i like dressing nicely um well, and see, now if i see that in you because you're the salesperson you know and and how you look matters in the eyes of the potential client and so maybe that's baked in there a little bit like the professionalism or the yeah i mean i think it just it matters to me you know like i think i like to take care of myself and i don't um 
all the things that though they take time, I guess I've decided they matter to me mm -hmm. enough to take my time. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I just like it. So you've come, uh, you've come a ways from where you were. What is something right now that you need that you don't have business wise? In terms of skills? No. Um, I mean, I, I feel like you guys are constantly casting in the net. I feel like that's what your whole marketing activity is about. You starting the podcast. You're, when did you start your audio podcast? Oh, a month and a month ago. What's it called so people can find it? Uh, build. Okay. It's build with Layla Hormozy. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but all of these efforts to put out content, to um, drop wisdom, all of this is in an effort to bring people back in, cast this net out to catch potential acquisition.com companies. Companies, mm -hmm. right? So I guess what I'm asking is you're casting nets, right? To continue to, to fill, you know, the, the buckets, but mm -hmm. like, what is something you guys don't have business asset wise or, um, or otherwise that you wish you had? I mean, all, all along the way, it seems like you've been filling up. I mean, we were talking off camera about your media team, you know, it started probably yeah. with one person, Caleb, right? And yeah. then Caleb started building the team and now you've got eight, 10, and now that's going to scale up to however big you want to go. Mm -hmm. That was something you didn't have before that you know, you now yeah. have along those lines. What's, let's look forward a little bit. What's something you need? Um, I think very soon we're going to need legal on our team. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, just because of, uh, we are, you know, we've been taking, we were taking smaller pieces of companies and then bigger. And then now it's, um, you know, still minority. Uh, however, some of them were taking up to 50%. Yeah. I was gonna say small is that five to 20 points or in the beginning it was like 10 to 20. And now the standard minimum would be 25. Um, but more often than not, you know, 33 and then more as of recently, 49 to 51. Mm, okay. Depending on the business and even of some of our already, you know, investments that we've been invested in for the last couple of years, further investing into those businesses because maybe the founder wants to cash out. Maybe, you know, we we have confidence in the business. We've now put a team in place there and we feel confident in the business enough to, you know, invest further into it. So, yeah. so is that because you want more control to be able to, um, manage your investment and your, your liability and all that? It's, it's kind of two sides to it. So if we have a good business and it's going well and we have a good partnership and that person after two years of working with us is like, I want my payday, right? Like they need to take some chips off the table. Who's better to invest in it further than us? We already know right. the business. I mean, right. there's no better investment for us than to further invest in that business. Um, I also get the sense though, that as you get into this business and you realize that it's a good business, you're almost a, kind of like, just get out of our way because we can do it better. <laughs> it goes back to that confidence. And it's not bragging, it, it's not arrogance. This is what I'll tell you though, is that this is all done, everything that we do with these businesses is through influence, not authority. It is 100% because they respect Alex and I. However, sometimes we don't pick well. And when you don't pick well, and somebody maybe disagrees with all of your decisions, then in those cases, yeah, I would like to have more authority to make sure the business doesn't go under or right. you know something to that extent. Yeah, because you're taking our money down with you. Right, but in most cases, that's not the case. It's just that if we're going to, the amount of resources that we've built at acquisition.com is more than any private equity firm I know of. The private equity firm that bought our last company doesn't do as much as we do for companies. And so I actually feel like I have built a company that is suitable to take more percentage of them and to take more control. Yeah. And we're overskilled for the amount, for the percent of investment we're taking in some of the companies or did in the past. Yeah. And so it almost just feels like um, we're matching better this time. Yeah. You know, we're taking a bigger percentage because we have the infrastructure to do so and we provide the value. Yeah, we've been talking around it a little bit. So what exactly are you doing for these companies? So what do you bring to the table? It's a little bit different with every company um, because obviously we've been growing and so it kind of changes along the way. Yeah. Um, I would say that it's a, 
a few different levels of assistance. So the biggest is like there's who, what, and how, right? So who is we recruit their leadership team. So okay. we have an in-house recruiting function. And so we recruit all of the leadership for all of our portfolio companies. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. And that's because that's what I, that's what I love. I love recruiting. I love getting the right people. Like that's my thing. So yeah. I was going to say that's probably all of you, right? It's, it's, I, well, I have my director of people because I was doing it and you can't do that and run the company, but yeah, but you, she's amazing. You, so you probably have them come in, have their palms up and then you like hold their wrists and you probably get a vibe check and you're like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I do a lot of. I like interviewing. So like, I like interviewing to put leaders in and, and yeah. to do that. Um, are you seeing um, more female leadership in place or is it uh, male or is it pretty equally skewed or what? What are you I seeing? I think it's always been equally skewed in my businesses because it's me and Alex. So I think- You want to make sure that there's equality. Yeah, it's been unintentional. It's just always, um, I've just never- it just, it's, you know, sometimes I think I'm going to get a female candidate, it's a male candidate. Sometimes I think I'm going to get a male candidate, it's a female candidate. So I just, I've just never aimed for that. It's just always happened. I think it's actually more that we attract both. You know, if it was yeah. a male led organization and there was no other female C level, you know, person on the team, right. more men would apply. I know a lot of women apply to work at our company because I'm the CEO. Yeah. I was but then say. Alex is also a figurehead. So you get equal. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, you're both alphas, right? It's a little bit intimidating. <laughs> Um, and so if you're an alpha female, that's going to be just fine because you, you're going to have mutual respect. But I, you know, if you look at Alex's face and brand, it's very alpha and yeah. very, you know, big beard, yeah, tank top, you know, that, that's yeah. a certain kind of a certain aura. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But to know that you guys are united like this, I think it, it works because yeah. I mean, if you know what really goes on, there's that yin and yang, there's that, you know, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's the who, then there's the what, which is we help, we essentially will only invest in businesses where we see that their strategy is off. So we see that. Oh, it's can, already broken. Well, it's either, it's not broken. It's, it's, it's 10% away. Okay. And we happen to know which, which direction to take it from that 10% or it's a company that could benefit from our network in the portfolio or our brand. Okay. So. Give me an Give example. Give you the three examples, right? Um, first one, strategy is off. Um, you know, we may find a business that, for example, um, one of our businesses, the guy was teaching people how to open photography studios. And they were able to open these photography studios for, you know, very little money down, maybe $10,000, $15,000. And they were able to make in their first year hundreds of thousands of dollars, like $250,000 on average. And he's selling this for like, Two thousand dollars to people online as like a, almost like an information, like a business opportunity, hmm. and we're like, we should turn that into a licensing business. Yeah, and so you know, we that was one of our first businesses. We turned it into a licensing business. They now have um, about forty some locations um, that are uh, it, it's uh, basically operated by the licensees, and it's worth. I can, I can tell you because it was audited. It was worth like over sixty million now. So taking a business that was just selling information for $2,000, you know, it's the same skill set, and then we can take it and put it into a better opportunity vehicle. Yeah, you built a ratchet. So it's like, I mean, they are forever, they're grateful that we own a percent of the business. Like they're happy to have us there. They yeah. don't, they they don't want have, it back. They couldn't have got there without you. Right. Yeah. And, and so the thing that Alex and I are very disciplined in is like, we're not going to take on a business where we don't think that we can provide outsized value. Right. That's so, just not our brand. So, the, you know, uh, saying, hey, I want 51%, it's not an unfair, you're not like grinding them. No, because you're saying, we would take 51% of a business that we also knew that if we talked about it on our channels, it would blow the business up. Right. And they could handle it because it's not a service business. It might be an e-commerce business. It might be a SaaS business and they could handle the inflow. Yeah. We might take advantage of a business that... Um, it's a sales organization and they recruit salespeople and fill and fill companies with sales teams, right? Okay, well, so hold, pause. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not hearing, maybe I'm missing it. I'm not hearing you selling via your channels. I'm not hearing you like pitching stuff. I mean, you're giving, you're dropping wisdom. You're giving, 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 yeah. giving. So how are you, how are you promoting these companies through your channels? What does that mean? We haven't yet. Okay. So what Alex and I agreed upon is that we would not promote a business that one, we didn't own 50% of, 
Two, we didn't absolutely believe in the product. And three, the business would not, wouldn't be able to sustain the inflow because we know right. based on our metrics of impressions and how many people you could break we do, it would break. Yeah. Right. Uh, so what does that look like when you eventually do it? Is it like this episode is brought to you by the photography studio license, blah, blah, blah. Or is it like, I think it's more one is we, we thought about doing basically, cause at some point we're going to be doing essentially like a mix of the shark take and profit type show where we feature businesses. Um, and we break them down, redo their strategy, kind of things like that, just to show people because it'd be interesting. Um, it would be interesting. Yeah. You, you know that I've, uh, I helped build Kevin O'Leary's YouTube channel. Oh, I think you mentioned that when I met you the first time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I got to sit in on many, 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 many episodes of the show and see that behind the scenes. So wait, you guys are thinking about doing mm -hmm. like to show people what it looks like or just like yes. behind the scenes? Okay. To show people. Um, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, and it would be fun. So that's partially why we need the studio and the office and all those things. Um, okay. So this is new. I like it. It's it's been there. It's just it you know it takes time. Well, um, I haven't heard about it. So this is okay. this is new to me. So there you go. Amazing. Okay. Um, and then you know one one side is we can feature the businesses there and show how the whole business works and explain everything. So smart. And they can decide if they want. Like we're never going to try and like sell something. Um. And the other one is just that we could bring them on and interview them as guests. Like it's very, none of it is in a sales e manner because the thing is, is that I think, you know, nowadays, if somebody wants to buy something and they see a company on a show, they go to Google, they Google it. And if they want to buy it, they do. Right. And if we are going to even have someone on any of our channels, it's because we believe in the company and we know they're a good company and we would like to maintain that by being very selective of who we bring on. Yeah. Now that you said the vision for it yeah. i completely get it yeah and i think it is an incredible idea yeah so that's what it looks like um the third piece to what we do with the companies is the how which is we have a team of subject matter experts mm -hmm. marketing sales cro hr finance yeah so once we determine the strategy for what do we need to change about in general the company like what's the company want to become let's talk about the three year the one year the this year and then, okay, cool. Then it's like, how do I do that? And oftentimes they have a skill deficit and they don't have the people on the team yet. You know, we're going to recruit them, but it takes time. We don't want to break them by adding seven people at once. Yeah. So we have, you know, subject matter experts or consultants that come in and they'll work on projects with the founders in the company or with mm -hmm. their leadership team to make sure that the strategy gets implemented correctly. So it's as needed implementation help. Um, and that's not typically something that um, much PE or conglomerates, because we're more of like a conglomerate, not PE. Um, but it's not something that you typically see. And it's something that we feel is important to acquisition.com because the reason people want to work with us is because we help them. You yeah. know, a lot of people, because we're giving them money, right? But I mean, honestly, you're just, you've taken a page from the Shark Tank playbook. I mean, this is what, this is what the sharks are doing. You know this, right? No. I don't know. This is what they're I've doing. I've watched the show. I don't know what they do after. This is what they're doing. And, uh, and you know, I've seen behind the scenes too. And, and I've sat next to the attorney who's negotiating the deals after they've already said, you know, we, you know, you got the deal. They go back um, and they talk about it with the business owner and say, listen, I know that we just agreed to this, but like, um, if you give us 51% of your company, you're going to be out of business in three years. So let's restructure the deal to make it more fair for you. Huh. Because we don't want to be, you know, we don't want to take over what you're doing. We want to help support you and augment and, you know, lend you media support or yeah. you can borrow our being famous or whatever. So they'll, they'll often restructure a deal. That's so cool. it's, yeah. So it's more fair. Um, you know, there are times when they are greedy or, you know, um, very sharp with their negotiation. Like, you know, Kevin always wants a royalty, blah, blah, blah. Um, but he'll lend out money to at a certain percentage, but yeah, you're, you're, you're playing by that same playbook. I think it's very smart. Hmm. It's what we like doing. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoy it. You know, also doing as, uh, Rob Deerdeck's doing that. Do you know Rob? Um, he's a former MTV guy. His he name had, is so familiar. He's a skateboarder. He was on that uh, MTV show, Ridiculousness. Oh, so bad with names. Uh, he had a show, Robin Big, back in the- Okay, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. He's in Beverly Hills doing that same thing. So anyway, um, smart. I get it now. 
I totally, I see the vision. Cool. Yeah, that's it. So good. And so we just want to do that with as many good companies as possible. All this is super valuable and fascinating just to see a little bit. I mean, that's what the show is about really is to pull back the curtain behind the curtain, right? And reveal, you know, the people who are really doing it, yeah, right? And how they do it and why they do it and kind of get in your brain a little bit about the process. It totally crystallized for me when you said that you're planning to do this. Because I was thinking, how are you? I mean, I know how like um, Kendall Jenner will or... or um, you know, if someone famous will promote their brand. They'll do a brand deal, or they'll create their own line and then use their fame to promote it. But that's not what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a totally different avenue. Yeah. Okay. We'll see if it works. Uh, final parting words for um, founders, CEOs, advice. Go. Talent is strategy. Like, I thoroughly believe that I just made a video on this earlier. Um, People don't beat their competitors by being smarter with their strategy. In fact, only one out of three strategies that a company sets out to do are actually executed. And the difference between the ones who are at one third versus those that can raise that to 78% is people. And so I've talked about it for years and I think it's often said like, oh, it's the soft stuff and it's less, that matters less than the marketing and the strategy and all that. It doesn't though. It is the most important thing. And I think... First and foremost, companies that scale are companies where the founders care. And I think that can be felt through an organization. If you care about the people, if you prioritize them, if you take care of them, if you do right by them, if you actually, you know, enroll people and, and you know, if you bring people in and genuinely show concern for what they think, what they feel and their opinions, then I think you're golden. And I think it we're coming to a, a day and age where compensation and benefits is no longer you're not, everyone can compete there. You know what I mean? Um, and it's not what people are interested in, especially this up and coming generation. They're not interested in that as much as they are learning, autonomy, um, you know, culture. Like those are the things impact. that are, yeah, impact. Um, and so I think like in all the time that I've been doing this, like it just always comes back around to the same thing. And I think that as the CEO of a company and, and for everyone out there that's listening that has a company, like we are the ones that get to choose you know, how people in our company behave and what we teach them and how we run things. And I don't know, I just, I, the reason I like having a business and the reason that I do what I do is because I genuinely want to create a place where people want to come to work every day. They want to like what they do. They love their job because I've had jobs I hate and it was the worst. And I want to help other founders do that too. And I can tell you out of the (laughs) hundreds of businesses and thousands of businesses that I've looked at the insides and done due diligence on, the businesses that will win are the ones where people actually genuinely give shit. Um, and it makes a big difference. And the ones that don't eventually implode. So I just don't think you can manufacture that. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. You know, tracking my roots, where I came from, and where I'm going. Sometimes, but still say it. Said I was quitting at 40 is just a fib. I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib. You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over every opportunity wasted. Good and bad news, which one you want first? Either way, you pick the bad, still gonna hurt you the worst. I never got the bask in the fruits of the label, and I never got the cash from that dude from the label. I'm just thinking back. Way 
retrospect, I would have did it the same. Uh -huh. In hindsight, I'm the only one to blame. Mm -hmm. I ain't picky, I'm just real specific. I want nothing less than terrific. I know y'all get it. I'm aggressive, so our style is clashing. Killer instinct, and I play with passion. I'd rather be hated for being one of the realest than get a lot of love for these overrated appearance. I can stand on skill alone, but I'm a package deal. I can write the whole song and rap for real. I got my head in the cloud with a pun intended. I don't need to see nobody, I don't want no visits Introverted, I just flirt with the music Small circle, how I choose it Stay away from squares, they the one that look like a L7 I've been doing this since I was 11 And the shit gets real Here we go way Time for the children. Now you can boo me. Jump off, I'm winning. I still lay it on. Shout out to the women. Watch, you was cool. They was acting wild. Walk in, leave drunk. It was packed for hour. Belligerent students, man, the shit got messy. Remind me of my first show. I did at the Red Sea. I ain't had no DJ, uh -huh. just the tape deck. Yeah. Opened up the son of Star Child. I love that. Met this cat named Larry. He was with the Avengers. Show me how to make moves and walk with the winners. Soon went to the pen and never seen him again. But I did a couple shows with his friends Lumberjack, brown clown, so-and-so And do -so with the orange pants Ten years later, now I'm rocking the orange pants <laughs> But they Jabos, though, you know Fresh to death, always and forever Don't get it twisted Number one listed Nitro, with the nice flow You know, get in Take a picture, baby, it'll last longer All in your Retrospect. I'm just thinking back to the time when it was all good. A golden era. 